Okay, shall we continue? Um, let's look into the, the common ways of describing a transport process. If you look into something being transported through a slice of a cementation material, you have several options on how to describe this because of the, the transport potentials actually governing this transport process. But we do not always use what is natural um, uh, that would be the actual uh, transport potential, but we're using what we can measure. So we are, we are using something that should be the, the state potential, but uh, something that is too complicated to measure. So we might instead use the concentration or the content of, of the species, the total species or what's in the pore solution and so on. But we are trying to describe the same thing. We are trying to describe the flux through. And if we are describing the flux through in different ways, there should be a, re a relationship between the, the material properties here, the transport properties. If it's a diffusion coefficient or if it's some, something else, a transport coefficient of some kind related to the state uh, parameter we have chosen. And then you can see here from these two equations that there, there is an obvious relationship between these two. That is related to the relationship between the total content of the species and the state of the species. And this relationship, if you do the mathematics here, you will end up with the diffusion coefficient being a function of the transport property divided by this uh, derivative. And this is the slope of a curve with the total content on one axis and the state potential on the others. And that is the slope of the binding isotherm. And the binding isotherm is very different for most transport processes. You recognize this one for, for moisture, that's the sorption isotherm. And, and you can see from the slope of that that the, the binding capacity, the slope, is not a constant. It varies with, what is this? It's your computer method. Um, so this relationship between the diffusion coefficient and the transport property is not a constant, it's a function of the, the state parameter. And you have to acknowledge that for most transport properties. Of course, if you would have transport of heat, it would be simple because that would be more or less a straight line here. As, as long as you are above zero degrees centigrade, you would have a straight line and the binding capacity would be a straight, would be a constant, the heat capacity. But for the transport process we are interested in, it could look like this. Carbonation would have a something called a binding capacity that is extremely high. Uh, and uh, it goes up here at very low concentrations of carbon dioxide. Any carbon dioxide will be bound more or less immediately. Leaching of hydroxides would require a certain concentration before you, you uh, change the balance so you can actually leach hydroxides out, at least, uh, at least alkali hydroxides. And the chloride binding isotherm would look like this up to crystallization. And you can see here that the slope will be different depending on the concentration like this. So this is an important parameter in the transport process. And that would mean that if you look into the, the slopes, they are certainly not constants more than for, for heat transport. But for the others here, you have a very complicated binding capacity that depends on the concentration of your species. This may, makes it difficult to, to predict the transport process. You need to know this kind of property. And I just 
put down some numbers here, some rough numbers of the binding capacity, which is the slope of the curve where you have the total content versus the state, the concentration or yes, the concentration of your species. And you can see here you're going from two, roughly two for chloride, to something extremely high for carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, moisture is somewhere in between here. Well, for moisture transport, we have a very high binding capacity comparing the moisture content with the vapor content in the pores. That is roughly something like 50,000 uh, relationship between those. But the important thing is that the binding capacity will slow down a penetration process. So if you have a penetration process like this, where you have no interaction, no binding, the penetration is fairly quick. Something outside the concrete will penetrate the pore system and simply fill the pores. That's a fairly quick process. But if you have interaction, during the penetration process, you have interaction with the surfaces, that will slow down your penetration process. And then if you then have a, a binding capacity of 300,000 or something like that, of course you will have a, an extremely slow penetration process compared to uh, what you have for uh, other uh, transport processes where the binding capacity is only two. And the penetration profile you get also depends on this uh, binding capacity. So the relationship between the, the binding isotherm and the penetration profile where you have the content versus depth here will be very different. So if you have something like a straight line here, the binding isotherm, if you refer to, to such a term, for instance, for carbonation, would give you a penetration that almost looks like a front, like this. A front is penetrating into the concrete, and as soon as the concentration of your species is somewhat above zero, you have a very high total content, like this. But if you have a a binding isotherm looking like this, where you have almost nothing bound here up to a certain level, level, and then you have a strong binding capacity, you will have something penetrating ahead of the front. If you have a straight line, you will have a penetration profile looking like this. And if you have something for, like for concrete, you should have a penetration profile looking like this. Uh, something for, uh, this could be for, for chlorides. You should have a penetration profile looking like that. So the fixation property is very decisive when it comes to the, 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 the shape of the, uh, the penetration profile. Let's look into different transport mechanisms for different species like gas, uh, and ions and, and moisture. <coughs> and of course, the, what we need to know is to be able to go from the, the micro and pore structure to get to something we could use for as a microscopic property for a piece of concrete. And I think some of you in your project here will work on this trying to go from the actual structure of your material all the way up by scaling up to something that we could measure on a microscopic specimen. And some others in other projects will try to measure this one and of course want to have an explanation why it looks like it is. And then you have to meet somewhere to hopefully understand what you have done. 
So this is what we try to do. But this is a tough time and we mostly we work here to make measurements on a macroscopic scale on a piece of concrete, on a specimen, measure our property, but we do not know always well, what is the relationship to the, the microstructure and the pore structure. We could go somewhere down here by using composite models, by varying the composition of our concrete and so on, but we have a long way to go and um, uh, we are looking forward to what you can achieve here. When you pick for your particular transport process, you pick a certain structure you, that you want to relate to the transport properties. Of course, you have to be careful about selecting a relevant level of, of structure. Because when you're talking about material science, you usually are thinking about atoms and molecules and, and uh, the very nanostructure of materials. But for concrete and um, cementitious materials, you might have to think in some cases, and in most cases perhaps, at another level. So that is fundamental, to select a proper level of the structure to try to understand what happened. For instance, if you have a structure like this, and you want to know what is the transport to be expected through a structure like this, you have to be careful so your actual structure doesn't look like this, where you have some larger defects, cracks and whatever, that is actually decisive for what you measure flowing through your material. It wouldn't help very much if you look into, only into this structure here, if you neglect, neglect this part here. And this is partly uh, the, one of the problems with concrete. What we could do is to have an, an, a simple way to explain or express the, um, uh, the structure of your material, but then you're actually going from measurements to giving you, getting a model of the structure. And that is by measuring the flux through a certain area of a, of a piece of, of a specimen. You have a certain thickness of your specimen. And you could have a simple model of your pore structure looking like this with one big pore having a certain area of the pore, a certain length larger than the thickness of your specimen. And the relationship between the pore area and the area of, of your material is one parameter you can have in your model. And the other relationship is, of course, the length of your pore structure compared to the thickness that would be called the tortuosity. And some, in some, or in most materials, you have a very large tortuosity where the transport of species have to go uh, very long ways through a member having a certain thickness. When you study also transport properties, you need to understand the effect of moisture. And I have a couple of pictures here demonstrating the effect of moisture on various transport processes. First, if you have a dry system, different pore sizes and a dry system, uh, of course you can get anything through. A gas uh, d would diffuse easily, would permeate easily, a vapor and so on, no problems at all. If you fill all the pores, have a saturated system, it would be easy to understand the penetration of a liquid, of course, in such a system. But from what, uh, what Matt has talked about this morning, we do not have a saturated system and we do not have a dry system. We have something in between that you could be showed with absorption isotherm. And that will give you an idea of the sizes of the pores. Uh, 
So depending on the humidity, different sizes or different sized pores will be filled with water or not. So that will give you a more complicated transport process where if you have a limited degree of saturation, the larger pores are open and the smaller pores are filled. And that will mean, of course, that a gas flow will be uh, easy occurring in the larger pores, but more or less prevented in the smaller pores. So depending on the pore network you have, that will have an effect on, on gas flow, gas diffusion, gas permeation. And of course, if you are looking into transport of ions, that can only happen in the, in the liquid. You need a continuous liquid path to get an ion transport through. But if the liquid path is interrupted or not present, you wouldn't have any transport of ions, of course. So there will be a moisture, a very strong moisture dependency of most transport processes. And uh, we will come into moisture as well. If we first look into gas transport, we have the permeation of gas or diffusion of gas. <coughs> permeation of gas means that you have a, a gas pressure difference and you have a flow of a fluid, the gas itself. And the fluid itself should penetrate through the pore system. And of course, it, it's, uh, it will be through the, the dry pore part of the pore system. The diffusion of gas is something different. Where you have no pressure difference, you have the sa same total gas pressure, but you still have a transport of a gas because there is a different concentrations in different positions. So this concentration difference will give you a diffusion process through the fluid. So the fluid could be air, for instance. And in air, you could have a gas. Could be oxygen, could be nitrogen, for instance, with concentration differences. And that would give you a diffusion of oxygen or, or nitrogen. Well, the permeation of gas is under a, a, a total gas pressure difference is very difficult to measure. What we can measure is the gas flow as a volume flow. We can measure the volume of a gas. We cannot measure the, the weight, the mass of a gas. So what we do usually measure is the, the volume of a, of, a, of a gas flowing through. But then we have to make sure that we know the pressure where we measure the gas volume, of course. Because if we measure the gas volume at another pressure, you would have another volume, of course. So this relationship would change through a specimen, for instance, where you have a pressure difference. You have different pressures at different positions, and that means that the relationship between the mass and the volume will be different everywhere. This makes it difficult to, to measure and, and describe permeation of gas. This is more natural to try to measure or to try to apply a concentration gradient of a gas without any pressure difference and then measure the flux going through. That would be more easy. But of course, these two will be depending on, uh, uh, on the, the moisture conditions. So we skip the um, carbonation models. This would be the moisture dependency of diffusion of a gas. One example here. But the diffusion coefficient depends on the relative humidity because, of course, moisture in a part of the pore system will totally, more or less totally block the diffusion and the permeation of a gas. A gas needs an open system, more or less, to be able to, to penetrate. And that means that there is a significant effect of relative humidity where the diffusion coefficient for a gas will drop very much when you're getting close to a th uh, almost saturation here. 
I had this fairly simple picture of the transport process involving diffusion of a gas, the CO2, in carbonation. And this, this moisture dependency makes it very difficult to try to describe such a transport process, since the diffusion coefficient for this penetration process here, this one here, depends on the moisture conditions, and that changes all the time. So, try to describe such a fairly simple process as carbonation. It's not easy. To do it, you need to describe the resistance to diffusion of carbon dioxide, to the resistance of diffusion of the gas. And that involves the resistance against diffusion of a gas through a th certain thickness where the moisture conditions vary will be dependent on the diffusion coefficient and its moisture dependency. And using this resistance to describe the depth of carbonation will give you an equation where the depth of carbonation is included. So how do you solve such an equation by you but what you want to know is included here. Well, you have to use a computer model to, to find a solution to such an equation. And then we have made it fairly simple. This is more or less physics involved in the transport process. Here we have skipped the, the um, uh, carbonation reaction and said that's immediate. Solving such an equation will give you moisture profiles like this. This is the, the surface, this is the depth, and these are the moisture profiles during a carbonation process. Because in the carbonated area, the material is carbonated, of course, which means that it has different moisture properties. The absorption isotherm is different, and of course the moisture transport properties are different. So that means that you will get a jump here at the carbonation front, or close to the carbonation front. So such a transport process involves describing the moisture conditions and the moisture variation, variations during the process itself. And we, in this model we simplified the carbonation profile to a front like this. In reality, we do not have that front. In reality, we have a carbonation profile looking something like this, where you have a certain degree of carbonation um, at the close to the surface, and then you have a very low degree of carbonation, of course, beyond the front. What about diffusion of ions? Well, diffusion of ions in a solution is fairly well understood and described. And usually it's described like this. This equation is called the fixed first law. And it includes the concentration of ions in the solution. And if you have a, a, a difference, the gradient will give you the flux of, of the ions. That's the idea with the diffusion coefficient depending on the type of ion and of course the type of material, if it's water or, or what. Uh, and this, if you put the numbers in here, this will always be in square meter per second. If we then go into a material, a porous material, where you have diffusion of ions. You have a moisture dependency, of course, because if the pore system is not fully saturated, you will have a limited portion of the pores giving you a continuous water path. 